Hi, everyone. I feel, I feel nervous without the, the Foucault thing next to me. I'm, I want it closer. <laughs> and I usually have my PowerPoint in front of me, but it won't load. And Strangely, like I straightened my hair like an idiot. You're going to do great, Jane. Okay, thanks. And then walked outside, and now my hair is curly, so you understand. Um, so welcome, everybody. <sighs> now I'm having a good time. Um, what brings you guys out tonight? Why are folks here? Raise your hand if you're really into death. Yeah? Death people? Foucault people? Anyone? It, like, one Foucault, like, are there any hardcore core Foucaultis around? I just like to know who I'm, like, how much I really have to pretend to know. No? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, okay, so what we're going to be doing tonight is, um, well, I should get my lecture notes out here. Um, to get, just to tell you a little bit about how we, I, we arrived at this talk, I've given, if you kind of look at the Think Olio, and let me know, can you, can you guys hear me? I've been having, you, no. It's also me. I seem to be get, like just sort of shrinking locally as a person lately. I don't know why. Okay, so um, what was I saying? This talk. How did we arrive here? I've been giving um, Foucault olios. We call them Foucaultios for the past couple of years, and I typically do the, you know the sexiest one, the history of sexuality, which is what I'm going to be talking about tonight. This little tiny book. Anyone read this at any point in their lives? A little bit. Kind of read parts of it, right? Um, here's the thing about Foucault, though. So I'm a historian. Um, He's t called a philosopher historian, right? I didn't cite him once in my dissertation. You're not, like, historians are actually not supposed to use Foucault. It's like, it's a dirty secret that I spent a lot of my time. Not because he writes about sex. Um, we can get to that later. But, um, so what was I saying here? Oh, what I, the, 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 the talks that we usually do on the history of sexuality, again, or right for thinking this book. But what most people don't realize, just raise your hands clearly, who has read part of the book? Part, volume one. Has anyone completed volume one? No, right? No, oh, so one person has? Okay. Um, and I'll actually point this, where's my, th um, that's okay. Is that Sheldon? No. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, What's interesting about this book is when I, when I actually completed it, I found that um, I'm a historian of death and slavery. I've been reading Foucault on the side. I wasn't always sure what, these two, what my two interests had to do with one another until I finally finished the fucking book and realized it's not actually a book about sexuality, it's a book about death. And so my interests had always been coinciding, and so we were always meant to be. Right? Foucault and I were always drawn towards each other. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So if, if you're not into death and you're not into Foucault, what are you here for? The sex part? Beer. Just to learn the beer? Um, I am curious. Did anyone just speak? Like, what, what drew you to this question? The oleos? Oh, the music. OK. I feel great now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get started here. Um, seems a little off topic, but hopefully I can tie it all together. Just mentally, because you know we can't spend too much time on this. Um, how many of you guys believe in human rights? Yeah, sure. Woo. Okay, what a crowd, right? Okay, um, so how do you define, like, just to ask ourselves, how do you define human rights? How do you delineate human rights? Um, it would be useful to have at least a couple of people give an answer and quick here because we're, we're going to move quickly through this. What are human rights? If you have to narrow it down, what are your basic human rights? Well, shelter. So, so, so shelter? Health care. Education. Education. Okay, different. Speech. Freedom of speech. So uh, the, the expression of self. Freedom from oppression? I would say yes, but that just means um, human rights, doesn't it? Like it's kind of evading the question, right? Um, okay, so thinking about this, from where do we get these rights? If they're human rights, then where do they come from? Being human, <laughs> right? We get them from being alive. Life gives us rights. 
being a human being gives us rights, right? We're getting to this notion of like humanism, he, concepts of humanity. Who's responsible for protecting your human rights? You are? Only? We have to protect each other. Okay, the state, right? Um, why is the state responsible to you? Because we, how do we make it? We participate in it, right? The social contract, right? Um, so I'm thinking about human uh, rights here. I want us, before we go into Foucault, I'm gonna try to do this in 30 seconds. Like Mike Myers in that coffee talk show on Saturday Night Live, right? Because it was the progressive era, it was neither progressive nor era, discuss, right? Okay. <laughs> I want to think a little bit about the concept of human rights and how they're often connected to the basic, it's hard to say this without, it's hard to make this sound profound without saying the most simple things, but you have rights because you're alive. What does, how do we measure life? Through these biological sort of measurings, right? Like um, very basic terminologies give you rights. You don't have rights because you're connected to the gods. You don't have rights because you're connected to the emperors. You don't have rights because special talents. You have rights because you're just flesh and you're breathing. That's it. That's why you get rights. Sorry, but sorry other animals, right? Um, okay, so the progressive era. The progressive era, you guys know about this. It, you guys all get the progressive era, right? Early 20th century. It is considered one of the most massive expansions of human rights protection in American history. To give you an example, there are, what, 27 constitutional amendments? Is that correct? I actually shouldn't, don't know. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Right? The first 10 are the, are the Bill of Rights. Three are passed during Civil War and Reconstruction. Four were passed during the progressive era. That's a very active moment of government. We've got the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th um, constitutional amendments. All sorts of uh, rights and laws and legislations were passed. New York City is actually a case study for progressivism. What happened in New York City to, quote, protect human rights in particular? The, yeah, union rights, labor rights, uh, the labor safety. What else? What's that? Yeah, children's rights, protecting ch like labor, um, living conditions. You have to have a window in your apartment now. You can't feed, they can't sell you swill milk. Do you guys know what swill milk was? Like when they would feed you, like give you blue milk for your babies and make them sick. It's illegal, right? FDA, all this stuff. So this little, if you think about this, the progressive era can be understood as a moment in time in which active citizenry combined with the expansion of government became very interested in the health of its citizens and keeping us healthy. Almost everything we defined, except for income tax law and women's right to vote, were about physical health. Does that make sense? Got it? Okay, cool. What else is the progressive era known for? What's that? Racism, Jim Crow, lynching, disenfranchisement of black men, um, 5,000 recorded lynchings of, of black Americans during this time. The active uh, re exclusion of black Americans from the body politic, right? So our question here is how could this moment of expansion of human rights co coincide with, um, and this wasn't some sort of like quote unquote typical progression of history. This was a connected event, right? The expansion of the citizen's health and the destruction of black health. Um, these, are, these are connected events. And so I'm hoping what we do with Foucault's History of Sexuality will help us understand what appear to be, it's easy to call it a contradiction in policy. It's easy and also correct to call it racism. But there's also something more at work here, he's going to argue. And that's really what this book is about. I was very surprised to find that out, and I finally finished the book. <laughs> and it made me understand why someone who's interested in slavery and death would be drawn again and again to this thinker. So um, questions for us to keep in mind throughout this, uh, the rest of my talk. What gives the state the right to protect your rights? <laughs> Have you ever thought about this? Like they define the rights and then you, they are, they, you have to submit to them protecting you. Anyone ever been protected against their will? Right? 
Anyone wanted to do a substance that they say, no, 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 we've got to keep you safe from that substance, right? Um, why, did these, <laughs> why did some of these rights increase at the same time other rights were restricted? And in a very basic sense, I, I say this to my students all the time, I'll say it over and over again, do you really think the government loves you? No. So when they are telling you, wash your hands before you go back to the dinner and eat, when they're telling you, take your vitamins, go running, we really want to see you live a long and happy life, why are they doing that? <laughs> they don't care about you, right? They really don't. An, an individual working with an institutional body might care about someone, but the state doesn't love you. I'm sorry if that breaks your heart. You guys go home and like that entry in your diary, it's like, dear state, I just found out. <laughs> it's not what we thought we were, right? Um, the state doesn't love you. You can disagree on that or not. Okay. So here's where we're starting. Now, I don't know if this is gonna, I have a video to introduce you guys to Michelle Foucault. I don't know if it's gonna start playing the moment I quick, uh, click sl uh, onto this next slide. Before I do, just curious, who has never read or ever heard of Michel Foucault? A few of us. I've got a guy who's going to describe him for us. His name is Jordan Peterson. <laughs> okay. So, you know, now I want to talk about postmodernism a little bit. Well, it seems to me that's my Michel Foucault in the middle and a more reprehensible individual you could hardly ever discover or even dream up no matter how twisted your imagination and uh, Foucault and Derrida I would say there's more but I would say they're the two architects of the of the of the postmodernist movement and in brief I think what they did was in the late 60s and early 70s they were avowed Marxists um, way way after anyone with any shred of ethical decency had stopped being a Marxist by that time even Jean-Paul Sartre had woken up enough to figure out that the Soviets hadn't ushered in the kingdom of heaven you know he had evidence stretching back 45 years that he could have attended to if he would have been willing to open his eyes talk about bad faith which was his crit ethical critique okay so <laughs> You guys got the picture, right? Did you hear? That's Jordan Peterson. He goes, a more despicable human being you could not possibly conceive of. Michel Foucault. That's when you know you're on the right side of history. When you like Foucault, Jordan Peterson speaks. I'm sorry if there's a Jordan Peterson fan in the room. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. My last talk, that actually happened. It was very awkward, and I felt bad for the guy. Um, so you know you're doing something right if you love someone that Jordan Peterson hates. OK. So that's not who Foucault is. He was, he was at one point um, a member of the Communist Party. He did study Marxist theory of history, but he's actually um, known and, and either embraced or, or hated or disparaged among academics for breaking with Marxist um, philosophy of history. He is not a technical historical materialist. In a nutshell, if Hegel thinks time goes in a spiral and is driven by thought and therefore God, Marx thinks time is linear, goes in one direction, and is driven by humans' relationship to the material reality. For Foucault, history doesn't really exist, and time is a dot. And you just kind of study history to see if there's really cool things people used to do, and maybe we could do them again. <laughs> I'm simplifying, but it's kind of what he did. OK, it does beg the question. Why am I a historian, <laughs> right? Okay, so my, my research, I just already mentioned, I, I, studied, I started off studying gender, then I studied race, slavery, um, eventually found myself studying death. I started reading Foucault in depth after grad school when you actually have time to read what you want. And I'm gonna share a personal story, it's very personal. Do I wanna share the story? I'm pausing. Uh, he saved my life. I'm just going to put it that way. He saved my life. I did, I, at one point in my life, very low time in my life, I did attempt suicide. Dark moment. So if you want to laugh because you're uncomfortable, it's okay. I'm still here. And what I found was, because I did not succeed, and what I found was when you attempt suicide and you end up in an institution to, that keeps you alive, and again, it'd be very, really inappropriate for me to ask, anyone else been there right after you tried to kill yourself? But I am wondering, anyone, right? 
they're understandably very angry with you. They're busy, they're nurses, they have jobs to do, and you've just self-harmed, right? And they do everything they can to make you as miserable as possible while you're in the hospital. And then they don't let you leave until you, it's confirmed that you're not going to kill yourself. And they invest, there's gotta be so much money spent keeping people like me alive, right? That can't be cheap. And while I was there, I was like, you know, I was like, I'm kind of glad I'm not dead. I'll get there eventually. Now I'm super glad I'm not dead. I'm, you know, I'm great. I'm fine now. But I was so pissed at the healthcare workers there. I'm like, what gives you the goddamn right to lock me in a room and keep me alive? Why am I not allowed to die? That's my right. Why can't I die? And interestingly, if it's so wrong for me to die, why am I not being arrested? Why isn't this a crime? Does that make sense? Why is the state investing thousands of dollars in something they don't think is a crime to keep some pitiful old person like me living? That should make you wary of them. <laughs> that was a really cynical thing to say, right? The fact that they don't let you kill yourself should make you critical of the state, but it did. So I got out of the hospital and I was like, just started reading Foucault. And he saved my life. And he made me, every time I get really depressed, I turn to a passage like this. He's being interviewed. He's often sort of characterized as obsessed with death and wanting to die. Uh, he, if you don't know much about him, he died at the age of 55, 54. He died of HIV AIDS related illness. He was one of the first well known people to die of the disease. Um, when asked if he regretted his lifestyle on his deathbed, he, he said to the interviewer, I'm dying of having sex with beautiful boys. What are you going to die from? Metal, man. Like, it's so metal, right? Like, <laughs> he was like, fuck you, I'm fine. He's like, I'm dying. Of sex, <laughs> right? Um, so let me share this passage with you to give you a little bit of an insight of, of, of our darling for the evening. Um, his interviewer is asking him what kind of pleasure he likes, and he's in America at the time. He says, a good club sandwich and a Coke. And he's French, right? He's like, doesn't, but I think he's making a point. Um, he says, actually, I have a real difficulty experiencing pleasure. I think that pleasure is, very is a very difficult behavior. It's not as simple as that to enjoy oneself. Ha, 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 with laughs. He says, and I must say that's my dream. I would like and hope I'll die of an overdose of pleasure of any kind because I think it's really difficult and I've always felt that feeling that I do not feel the pleasure, the complete and total pleasure, and for me, that's related to death. Chew on it. Chew on it. The interviewer says, why would you say that? Because I think that kind of pleasure I would consider as the real pleasure would be so deep, so intense, so overwhelming that I couldn't survive it. I would die. I'll give you a clearer and simple example. <laughs> I was once struck by, the, uh, by a car in the street. I was walking, and for maybe two seconds I had the impression that I was dying, and it was really a very, very intense pleasure. The weather was wonderful. It was seven o'clock during the summer. The sun was descending. The sky was very wonderful and blue and so on. It was, it still is now, my best memory, <laughs> right? So hearing passages like this, it's easy to dismiss him as, uh, I don't know, as being saucy, being kind of like flip, right? I do kind of, I do kind of picture him like being interviewed by an American, and he's like this smart French philosopher, I don't, whatever. Um, anyone else hear anything different there, though? Okay, there's often this idea that people that are embracing death hate life, and, light, and somehow death is freedom. We all know this, this sort of trope, don't we? What I'm starting to learn from Foucault and, and, and from studying this is part of the reason I believe he kept bringing us back poetically to passages like this is to remind us of how the state now operates. It operates by generating life and denying death to certain populations, which is important to keep in mind. Certain populations, right? And so by reminding us that we cannot die and we can't, we're not allowed to celebrate death, he's pointing, he always said, my job is to make windows where there once were walls. I want to show you, I want to reveal to you how power is operating because most of us can't see it. 
I don't know how this guy could see it. He was a very special creature. Um, so I also love him. And I just want to play a little video of you. This is just us together. I made a stand-up of him. And this is just me. Oh, wait. Will it play? Tied flowers in his hair, you know. It's totally normal. Historians do this thing all the time. <laughs> Let's do some real history, right? Okay. Isn't that cute, though? It is pretty adorable. So what we're talking tonight about, this book, History of Sexuality and Its Relationship to Death. Um, so I've already told you my relationship to, to Foucault. He was, if you don't know much about him, he was a, he called himself a philosopher historian. He was kind of the biggest historian of the 20th century um, in France, at least during part of the century. He lived, he was born in the 20s. He died in the 80s in Europe. So keep in mind, what did he bear witness to in his lifetime? World War II, right? Like he, he is of the European mindset that death is everywhere, right? Um, so keep, this is kind of crucial for understanding his thinking. Um, he was born privileged. He hated being part of the bourgeoisie, or I never had, know if I'm saying that word right. His dad wanted to become a doctor. So he grew up hating doctors instead um, and became a philosopher. He never identified as gay. He only had sex with men. He didn't identify because, not because he was closeted, he thought identification was a trap. Visibility is a trap. They're, don't let them name you, he said, right? So he was not closeted, trust me. <laughs> um, what else do we need to know about him? I think it's important to understand that his father, he was confined against his will four times as a teenager and tortured by a psychiatrist for being gay. Even though he wouldn't call himself gay, but you know, electric shock therapy, et cetera. Um, his works, he started off writing about, you know, mental illness. He went on to write about the history of prisons. He, made, he basically writes about modern power and how modern power operates through the modern institution. So if you need to s summarize Foucault in two words, it's power and knowledge. And what he argues, and I'm trying to summarize a lot here very quickly, a lot of folks, if you, how do most folks combine the words power and knowledge? How do, they, how, we, how do we typically relate these terms? That knowledge is empowering, right? You see it like, on, is that, I don't have a TV anymore, but when I was a kid, like that, that um, the more you know those commercials, the more, the more your power, whatever. He argues almost the opposite. He argues that knowledge is how power gains control over us. Does that make sense? He says, knowledge is not for knowing, knowledge is for cutting. Um, the state is, legit is legitimized or uh, has its credentials to expand its power because it has knowledge. Do you hear the difference? Its power comes from knowledge. Because, uh, does anyone want me to explain that more? I see some, you do, okay. How do the, the old, old forms of power before democracy, the king, how did he become the king? What's that? Divine power. You were born the king. It was like through blood lineage. You become the king. You're born that way. God literally appointed you. There was some idea that um, divine right of kings. There's like, isn't there a belief that you're actually God's cousin on some level? Like it was kind of like, like a kinship notion. So nobody has to agree with or disagree with the king, right? The king is the king because the king is the king. Don't question the king. Our president, how do they become president technically? We elect them, right? So they have to be legitimate. We have to consent to their power. And therefore, their power, um, he, what Foucault argues, is this new form of power is rooted in what we call rationality. It's rational consent that allows power to operate. We must believe that power is operating rationally. It doesn't kill willy-nilly. It kills to protect. Do you hear the difference? 
Does that make sense? Someone go, I get it now. You don't get it? You do get it. Okay. Um, okay, so history of sexuality. I'm going to give you a little brief overview of the book, and then we'll spend the, some time with the, the death section here. The history, uh, so history of sexuality and the problem with 73. This is a hugely influential book. Every person that I've met, like when I was assigned this in grad school, everyone would say, just read to page 73 and, and don't forget about it. You don't need to really read the whole thing. And so what's come out of this book is this really important discussion of the concept of sexuality, but what's been left out is what we're going to fill in tonight. It's relationship to death and, importantly, to racism. I didn't realize reading Foucault for a long time. He, w he witnessed the Holocaust. He's very interested in state racism and the state's rationality in killing. And he argues that sexuality is inherently a racial concept, right? So when I say the word, I feel like I'm asking for a call and response. I'm not. But, um, what, do you, what, what does sexuality mean for you? Like, what does it conjure in your mind? That's a weird way to ask that question. How do you define sexuality? You guys are quiet. Jump in. Come on. What is sexuality? What's that? That, that it can't be defined, is that what you're saying? I think that's what, yeah, I'm just, I guess what I'm asking is, um, I just really want to know what do you think, like, how do you use the word sexuality? Most of us, if I was like, what's his sexuality? Yeah, we're us we usually use the term sexuality to discuss people's sexual identity categories, gay, straight, bi, or we'd use it to discuss like politics of pleasure, right? Um, and so this book said about dismantling those ideas, that sexuality is rooted in somebody's sense of self. So let me give you a quick overview of its essential arguments up to page 73, and then we'll see if we can understand what does this have to do with death and with race? Like, do sex, death, and race all have something necessarily in common with each other, right? Are they all like, I mean, you guys can answer the question. Which one of them is real? Sexuality, race, or death? <laughs> death. The other two are made up, right? <laughs> and, they're, and Foucault is going to argue is that they're made up to mask the way death operates in a very similar way, right? It's, okay. So, in a nutshell, what does he argue up to page 73? I'm going to do my, the thing that I'm, is annoying, they tell me not to do. How am I doing for time? We're good? I'm just going to keep going. OK. He argues that sexuality is not an instinct. It is not a natural instinct. It is not something that is pre is, there's no prediscursive drive in you, and it's not your identity. Um, prediscursive means prelinguistic. He argues that the idea of the sexual drive um, was invented discursively in the 19th century, um, discursively just through language, through talking about it. So he really gives a lot of credit to the, val to the power of language to create new reality, right? Um, does he think that people didn't want to have sex? No. <laughs> he liked sex. I bet he thinks everybody always liked sex, right? But the concept of sexuality was new, he argued. And he said that the idea of a, like a natural sexual instinct that defines who you are and is somehow actually the most essential part of your being? I mean, who, who thinks this way? He's actually, what, like think about Freud, right, for example. Like the, the, the what is it called, the libido, the, the libido drive, what is it? Yeah, like the libido is supposed to be driving every other action in your life. Like once this idea gets accepted, we have, we have this belief that somehow our sex drive is at the root of everything else we're doing, right? And that's the thing that Foucault's questioning. He's like, there's no such single kernel. There's no like little tiny like golden nugget of sex drive in you that's programming you. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? He's like, that's made up. Having sex always happened. Two different things, right? Um, 
This is the one that's really important. This is what he's like probably most famous for in this book. Sexuality, he argues, was never repressed. In the 19th century, the era of the Victorian period, sorry if you've seen my other Foucault, Foucaultios, because I'm doing a little bit of review here, but this idea that the, the dominant narrative of sex, right, or sexuality, is that in the past, particularly the 18th and 19th century, people were super repressed. Um, you know, there's a joke about Victorians like putting stockings on their piano legs because they were so like scandalized by the sexiness of the piano legs, right? Um, he argues that, so this, the dominant narrative of sex is that people used to be very closeted about it, very ashamed of it. The 20th century happened, we started speaking about it, we had sexual revolutions, we went to therapy, we went to streets, we wave flags, we go down, mar you know, right? Now we're open, sex is free. We set sex free. He says, he has this great line, he says, tomorrow sex is gonna be good again. Do you hear like the historical imagination and the idea that sex used to be bad? Like it's like, oh, I bet when we were like cave people, sex was good. And then like when, once we had like typewriters, sex got bad. And now we're like, we're getting, we're, call, we're calling it back, right? Um, he said, no, 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 that never happened. Because during the time period in which we said sexuality was repressed, people were talking about sex more than they ever had. Any, like, there was so, he, and it, the language of the book is very funny. It's like the, per, like the pro, proliferation of discourse was penetrating every surface. And he's like always like, ha, 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 like making all these like sex jokes in the book, right? Um, he said we were actually talking about sex constantly and pretending that we weren't talking about it. He said it's the only society that he has ever studied in history, and he seems to have studied literally all of them that described sex as the fundamental secret while pretending to keep it a secret. <laughs> but all they're doing is talking about it. And it's important to understand that what he, he, what he is not arguing. He is not arguing that people were driven to become sexual because they were told not to be sexual. Does that make sense? Like, the ele don't think about the elephant? You understand this, right? Don't think about the elephant makes you think about the elephant, right? He's saying, no, 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 it's not that kind of power technique. It's the moment, I don't know, it's like the elephant is, I can't, how can I say, the repression, the experience of saying, shh, that's sexuality. There was never anything under it. Does that mean? There was never a drive under it. It's the pushing down that is sexuality. For Westerners, he argues, we don't have sexuality. We have sex, but we don't have sexuality as identity categories and as driving forces without the experience of it resisting it. Yeah. What's that? That's the same thing with like racism or race, and I know you're going to go through. Well, in somewhat, right? Like he's, and he's, cause he's going to ask, like, why are we saying that it's the secret that we won't stop talking about, right? Like, why are we saying it's the, uh, exactly, well, yeah, I'll come back to this. Um, okay, any question? anyone not believe him on this one, say, yeah. Is it about shame? Oh, good question. Is it about shame? Um, he... He thinks that shame is an integral part to sexuality in, in the West. So here's a, a, a useful, um, in my longer discussion of the, of the first 73 pages, I always bring in images of um, like modern, by, by modern, I mean 1970s like porn, and then compare it to like Kama Sutra images, because so, he, he, he compares it to an Eastern culture that he says is rooted in ours erotica, which is rooted in um, like a pleasure discourse, as opposed to scientia sexualis. And what's interesting is if you look at the, like all pornographic imagery that I can, like almost anything that I can find out there, there's, I just have to act it out because I don't have the picture. Uh, don't worry, it's not, I just, I'm not gonna act it out. But like, <laughs> it's like the woman, the women are always like going like, do you know what I mean? They're like, oh, it's, ooh. Like, like I shouldn't really be doing this, but I will, right? There's the only, it wouldn't be sexy for Westerners he argues, if she's like, hi, I'm a nice person, let's get to know, it. hi, I think that feels good, right? Kama Sutra is like that. If you look at a lot of the Kama Sutra images, they're smiling, and they're like, both of the, char both of the people in the imagery are looking at the viewer and smiling like, yay, you're having sex, right? 
and for Westerners, it's a very, I, I don't think they're beautiful, but I actually don't find them erotic. Like, I don't get turned on by the Kama Sutra. I, you know, I do get turned on by porn. Um, so it's not shame, it's just that power, he says power and pleasure are intricately, like, they are the same thing here. They are, let's see, he's like, so just go to a BDSM dungeon and act it out. Put it outside of you, at least, so you can see how it's operating, right? Um, importantly, he argues that the invention of sexuality invented sexual identity categories. Um, people have always had sex uh, that we would call gay sex, but there was never such thing as a gay person or a straight person before the 18th and 19th century. Um, in Puritan Massachusetts, for example, I'm doing my American history class now, do we think of these people as sexy? Right, they actually were. Women could divorce their husbands if they were not getting them off. They really valued sexual pleasure in Puritan culture. <laughs> they were probably more comfortable talking about sex than all of you guys in the room, because you guys have been really quiet every time I ask a sex question. <laughs> this is a room full of Puritans, it'd be very different. Um, <laughs> No, but in, pure, in a Puritan society, who gets whipped at the stake for doing something bad sexually? What's that? <laughs> women? It's tip, in, in, the, in the general imagery, it's women who have had, who quote, got pregnant outside of marriage. So it's heterosexual pairing that produces an offspring, right? I'm not saying that that's a good thing to do, but I can at least kind of understand a social policing system that's trying to limit the making of a human that, where there's no social network to take care of it. Like, there's some, whatever, I'm not, please don't misquote me on that one. Don't ever, ever whip women, ever, for anything. But now, who's getting whipped at the stake metaphorically? And by now, I mean the 20th century. Women, not for having babies though, right? For trying not to have babies and gays. We now go after non-procreative sex, right? So this is just one example of this. So during, if, in Puritan, uh, let's go back to the Puritans for a minute. There's this, if you've, my last, oh yeah, I was discussing this guy. There's this one guy that shows up in the archives four times. The f I can't remember his name, but the first three times he was arrested and whipped and fined for public masturbation. The fourth time he shows up in the records, he's just been elected to public office. <laughs> right? He had. What does that tell us? There was something in the Puritan imagination that could imagine somebody doing something improper sexually without being a, quote, improper person. That what they did sexually wasn't any different than maybe stealing a loaf of bread. It was something that, it was just a wrong among other wrongs. And at that time, and all the way through the 17th century, um, the penalty for having, quote, gay sex was the same penalty, if not less, than the, um, having sex outside of marriage, heterosexual sex outside of marriage, right? So now we're at this point in time by the 19th century where the, the person that is most focused on, he argues, is the gay man, and that, that the shift in that focus has produced sexual identity as a category, where people are, quote, gay or straight. And he has a real problem with this. In the past, he says, the sodomite was an aberration. The homosexual has become a species. It's a kind of person, right? And it's, anyone have questions about this point? What are you guys thinking? Yeah. Like the fact that it, the person becomes, a th like it becomes a type of person. Like how does it really? Do you think it's alleviating or increasing? Do you think it makes more shame to become the homosexual? Or is it like, or to just have committed? Right. He would argue that. It, whether it's shame or whether it's pride, it increases the significance attached to the act, right? So um, the importance of the species aspect of it, he's very interested in like, why would suddenly what somebody does with their genitals define them as a kind of person, right? Like, 
it, it, other, we, we all have preferences. At one point in history, medicine, the law, all lined up to say what you do in bed defines you and starts to become incredibly invested in it. And we normalize it. We act like it's normal that we have to continually like, ask ourselves, am I good sexually? What kind of sexual person am I? Is my boyfriend really gay or straight? You know, like, all these questions become very, because we think it's the truth of ourselves, right? Um, he argues that, this sh that in this, there was a, a shift from sin to sickness, meaning it was no longer the church that controls us, but doctors. And at first, Amasha, to your question, this is often viewed as a way of destigmatizing sexuality because you can't help it, you were born that way. If it's your species, if it's a kind of person, are you starting to hear how sexuality is related to racial concepts? The idea that it's in your body, you can't change it, right? Um, this was initially to kind of liberate, it was framed in terms of liberation. And a lot of the doctors that were doing this early sexology research were gay. And they were trying to you know, alleviate the stigma around the acts or either called crimes, what have you. Um, but he said that this are looking for the truth of yourself, you're, you're condemned. You will never find the truth of yourself. He calls it a truth game. He said, no, don't confess. He says, Western man has become a confessing animal. We think we must tell the truth of who we are. And in order to do that, you gotta know exactly who you are. And then when you reveal it, you'll be free. He's like, no, when you reveal it, everybody will know your creepiest de desires. Just keep your mouth shut. Why would you tell somebody that? I'm joking, but like, not really. Think about cannibal cop. You guys know who I'm talking about? Yeah. The guy that was arrested and imprisoned for a sexual fantasy. It was a pretty damn disturbing one. When, you know, as a woman, when I read it, I was like, ah, ah. He wanted to slowly cook and roast and eat women. And he had plans for it, like drawn out, but that was the fantasy, was drawing the plans. He wasn't, I mean, we don't know if he was going to do it. We know he'd had the fantasy for a very long time. He's in prison. What do you guys think about this? What's that? A minority? Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, absolutely, right, yeah. It's the idea that sexuality, this was part of his argument, sexuality, how, how had the doctors and, and the other sort of control mechanisms in our society achieved this level of power? How could somebody get locked up in a cage for having a thought? It's because we have been convinced by power that sexuality can, carries with it all other contagions, all other forms of danger, right? Um, STDs, moral decay, communism. In the 1950s, there was a con like people were absolutely convinced that the Russians were going to get us through the gays. That's how they're going to get into the country. Yeah, there's a question back here. He had never, he, there was no one that he was going to do it to. I mean, he, and his fantasy was harming somebody. But I think about maybe wanting to like metaphorically kick me, all men in the balls sometimes because I'm angry at men sometimes. <laughs> Does that make sense? But I don't have an intent to harm anybody. Does that like, I don't, don't just sometimes, not very often. Okay. <laughs> um, so he says this is a truth game and, it, and the, the, the problem in it is that it's, it pretends to be liberating you when actually it's getting you involved in internalizing the police. They're inside you now. You actually think, I've got to tell somebody I'm thinking those bad thoughts. Why are you telling anybody, right? If you've had, quote, weird sex one time in college, right? You think about it for the rest of your life and wonder, is that who I, quote, really am? The truth, right? He's like, you're no one. I have tattooed on my arm a quote from him which you, I actually think he would love the tattoo. I think he, people are like, Foucault would never get into the idea of tattoos. I'm like, you don't know him. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> it says, uh, do not ask who I am and do not ask me to remain the same. When somebody's asking him, what kind of writer are you? And also like, are you guys like, stop 
asking me to define myself. That is tyranny. You know who he reminds me of? Freddie Mercury. <laughs> Same thing. Yeah, was there a question back here? Yeah. Can you speak up just a little bit? I just got a fan over here. So, yeah, is your question, do, does he really actually find it dangerous to identify? Is that what you asked? Right, yeah. This is a tricky question. And one thing I think it's important, Foucault once said, which makes me hate him because it's so clever, he's like, if I'm wrong, I'll, if I'm right, I'll be wrong someday. Do you get how that means he's literally always going to be right? But he did argue that no philosopher should be read that deeply outside of the context of the time in which they were writing. He didn't believe in like a Kantian like rational law. I don't know that he would feel the same way about identity, identification, I don't want to say identity politics, but identification now, as he did in the 70s, but he might. It's not so much that he was saying it was necessarily dangerous. What he was trying to explain is how it was connected to modern power and how modern power is operating invisibly and then you decide for yourself. He did say very importantly, don't, he would never give any advice about social change. He, he was an activist himself, he's a prison abolitionist, but he believed because he was elite, he should never tell people what to do. He believed his position of power made, him not, it, made it impossible for him like, change has to come from below, he argued. He's like, look what happened when other big thinkers tried to start revolutions. We should just describe the world and then shut the fuck up, right? Okay, so, sorry, I cost all the time. And then finally, he argues that be, because we are so obsessed with sexuality, I love this line, he says it three t He says, we are perverts, that's earlier in the paragraph. Modern society is perverse. In actual fact, directly perverse. In actual fact. He's like, we are creepy, we're perverts, we're weird. We think about sex all the time. What's wrong with us, right? Um, so I want to show you guys a clip. Where am I? Can somebody tell me the time? I'm, I do this all the time. What? OK. Creates a distance should be avoided. And try not to frown. I'm sorry, was I frowning? You have to relax. How can I be expected to open up if you're not relaxed? Right. Take a deep breath. Start again. As you can see, this piece of paper has been divided into squares. There are 287 of them. Your sex history will fit on this single page in a cryptic code. Don't forget to mention that there's no written key to the code. The interview subject will only be candid if he knows he's speaking in the strictest confidence. Right. Okay. So, when were you born? June 23rd, 1894. Are you single or married? Married. What is your race? Don't waste time asking the obvious, Martin. Fill it in yourself. What is your religion? Methodist. How often do you attend church? Not at all now, but I did regularly until I was 19. How did you get along with your father and mother when you were growing up? That's a multiple question. It allows me to ignore any part I don't want to answer. How did you get along with your mother? Fine. We had a close relationship. And your father? How did you get along with your father? So now obviously Kinsey's gonna have a flashback to his father, just to be very clear. That's Kinsey training, who's a sex researcher in the 20th what century, training his graduate student to take questionnaires. We turn away from matters of the flesh. We turn to things of the spirit. Lust has a thousand avenues. The dance hall, the ice cream parlor, the tenement saloon, the Turkish bath. Like the Hydra, 
It grows new heads everywhere. Even the modern inventions of science are used to cultivate immorality. The gas engine has brought us the automobile joyride. And an even more pernicious menace, the roadside brothel. Electricity has made possible the degrading picture show. Because of the telephone, a young woman can hear the voice of her suitor on the pillow right next to her. And let's not forget it, the most scandalous invention of all, the talon slide fastener, otherwise known as the zipper, which provides every man and boy speedy access to moral oblivion. Are you currently in good health? I suppose so. What makes you doubtful? Every doctor I've ever seen. Um, so did you guys see a couple of things going on here? Uh, Kinsey will go on in this clip to chide his grad student for expressing having any facial expressions. He says, you have to uh, keep your, your face totally blank. Why? Science has to be objective. So one of the dangers when science takes over sexual, sexual Sex becomes the domain of science. Science appears objective. It doesn't appear to have a political or moral aim. That can be the danger that Foucault is trying to reference for us. So that's, that's the scene there. What else does this scene capture? He, in his flashback to his dad, Lithgow is his dad. Shame. What's that? Shame. Shame. He, so the guys, he's, yeah. He thinks that telephones are sexual. And this is before selfies, guys. <laughs> this is like, people are still sending telegraphs. Do you see, you know what I'm saying? It's like, boop, 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 boop. Like, he's sexualizing everything. That's what Foucault means when he's like, there's no such thing as repression. There is, he calls it proliferation. It's inviting it. It's like saying, come here, come here. Sex, 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 sex. Why are there walls in poor people's homes in the 19th century? Always used to be four walls. Then they start building a wall in the 19th century. Why? So kids can't watch parents have sex because that could ruin them forever. Sex is dangerous, right? We must protect children from sex. So do you see in this scene, this guy is like sexualizing everything in this person's life and then telling them that they're fucked up for thinking about that sex. It's like, dude, you're the one who just told me that the movie, the talking picture show about Bambi is a sex show. Do you see what I'm saying? It's like, they're over, he's like, that's what we mean by perverts. So what is sexuality? And then what is its relationship to death? He says it's a his name that can be given to a historical construct which became central to the mechanics of modern power. Cool, I'll tell you what that means. All it is is a name given to a tool. Like power is out there and there's tools that make it work, right? What's the most obvious forms of modern power in your lives right now? What's that? Money, Money police, <laughs> right? Cops everywhere, like we live in a police state. 1% of the adult population lives in a cage. No human society has ever done this before, ever, right? Power is everywhere. So one of the tools of that power scheme, he's arguing, is a belief in sexuality because what it implies is a belief in typology of being. There's a criminal who's actually a criminal. Does that make sense? You don't commit a crime, you're a criminal. Um, he's, I love, he says it's just an, ex this is, we're really getting to the death and race part. There's a very poetic way. To read Foucault, you have to kind of like let your eyes go dim and just like soften your face and like, what? Until it just goes, oh, I got it. It's like, it's, it's like reading poetry. You're like, what does it mean? And you get it. But he argues it's an essentially dense transfer point of power that is particularly capable of multiple tasks. So if we think about power, power always has a few things that it wants to do. Modern power does, right? What, are the, what do our modern power want us to do right now? The modern nation state wants us to be in debt, um, work till we to work till we die, um, turn against working class people, turn against other, right? Has a lot of things on the agenda, doesn't it? 
Does it want to keep you safe? No. No. Well, we'll see. Some of us, right, to justify its power. But he's saying sex is the perfect locus for all those mechanics of power to like inter, like to, you get it? That's how I teach. Like, my students are like, what, professor? I'm like, like that. <laughs> you get it? OK. Um, so let's think about power here. Back to the king. Back to the king. Anyone have any questions right now? I know I'm talking quickly. I can't help it. I talk fast. Anyone into this? This is like, the, I, like your faces. I'm like, what are you thinking? OK. This is the last chapter of the book that no one ever reads. And it is like you're, you're reading. I'll actually, let me just like read like the first f sentences of it. You're reading like sex, 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 sodomy, 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 sex, sex, sex. Um, for a long time, the characteristics of the privileges of the sovereign was the right to decide life and death. You're like, what? Why are we talking about the king and his power to kill you? Remember, this is an introduction to what was going to be a five volume set. This is the introduction. <laughs> so hard to understand. It's just the introduction. So pre-modern power. Whoops. The sovereign's power to kill. He had absolute power, and he had the power to kill directly or indirectly to protect his own life, not to protect yours. If anybody threatened to kill the king, psh, cut their head off. If another uh, nation state or, na or, or sovereignty sort of comes after the king, he could indirectly kill his subjects by forcing them to go to war. Were they going to war to protect their people? No. They're always protecting the idea of the king. So he has absolute control over life and death. And he doesn't have to legitimate it. He doesn't have to explain it. Why? He's the motherfucking king. Nobody can question him, right? His power is absolute. And it's rooted in violence. The, he's, Foucault says power will always come back to the sword, even today. That's why we need, he argues, quote, a killable population. So power operated primarily through subtraction. If you do something bad, you disappear. And you disappear very visibly. That was a weird way to say that. <laughs> Didn't intend for that to come out like that. If you get executed in pre-modern history by the king, how does it happen? Like on a public stage, because he is demonstrating his power to kill. That's part of how his power is maintained, right? By demonstrating it. We don't do that anymore, though, do we? Do we still execute? But we don't watch it. And if you don't know this already, people don't, who are the executioners don't even know if they're the ones executing. There's like five buttons that, that everyone pushes a button. Nobody knows which contains the death serum. So nobody knows that they're, they're the executioner. The executioner used to be right out there doing the job. <laughs> you saw power plainly. We don't see it anymore. That's what he's concerned about. Modern power, he says, operates in the positive, in the addition. Um, and this is not necessarily saying happy, but he's saying it operates by inviting us to join it, by believing that it's working for us. Eat your vegetables, go to the gym, make sure you're going to the doctor. Are you feeling sad? Maybe you should go to a therapist. Take care of you. You matter, right? That's how modern power operates. Um, I was actually going to play, if I had time, but I don't. Can I ask the classical musicians to play Radiohead's, um, what is that song? Fitter, happier, do you guys know this? Fitter, happier, more productive. <laughs> not, not drinking too much. Regular exercise at the gym. That would be amazing if the classical musicians could play that. But you get, like, modern power operates by appearing benevolent. And it's legit, why does it have to do this? Because it's legitimacy, literally, in the social contract. We have the right to what? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of property. The social contract means the government only exists to protect those things. It's literally the social contract is a death contract. Does that make sense? It's, government must be appearing to protect us. And also, think about the role of death in government now. How is death different between kings and presidents? 
There's this, in, in death historiography, there's this idea that death disappeared in the 20th century. The rise of funeral homes after the Civil War, nobody washes their kin's dead anymore. They hire a professional to take the dead person away, to clean it up, you don't even touch it. Goes in the ground or whatever, right? And people have often argued that that's just like technology, et cetera, changing sensibilities. Foucault argues, no, 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 no. That's because death is no longer serving the state. When the king died, everything changed. It was a new queen or king. It's like, oh my gosh, what if they're Catholic? Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, ah, what if they're Protestants? Everything's gonna change. The president can never die, why? Because it's the office. The office of the presidency remains the same. Nation states can't die. In a historical, the historiosity of this, Modern nation states, quote, civilization, otherwise known as, quote, whiteness. <laughs> My work is in like trying to understand how death is a racial concept. White nation states configure themselves as being in incapable of dying. The heads of states are just replaced by another one, just replaced by another one. Lincoln's body, I think, was like one of the last bodies that was really we're not like every, we're not, went everywhere. Like when the, my hometown, I was like everyone's like that's where Lincoln's body came on the train. Everyone went and looked at it, right? So death, he argues, has dis dis disappeared not because we think death is gross, but death doesn't serve the nation state anymore. Someone point out an obvious flaw: has death disappeared? De have dead dot bodies disappeared from our? Get on Facebook. Anyone see any dead bodies in the past few years? Constantly. Michael Brown's body was on display, laid on the ground for four hours untended. We watched Eric Garner die over and over and over again. We have a lot of public death, don't we? Foucault argues, no matter how benevolent power is, there has to be reference to the sword for the rest of, quote, us to invest in its, quote, unquote, legitimate policies its benevolent policies. Therefore, there will be an, quote, underclass, a killable body. Um, who's the woman who wrote kill, uh, Killing the Black Body? Dorothy, oh, never mind. Her work very much coincides with this, right? The same time that white women were being encouraged to, that the responsible couple um, being encouraged to reproduce in the 1950s, black women were being sterilized against their will. Right, so there's, power has to include, he argues, a body that can be destroyed. And what's different about war now, when we think about death, he was like, yeah, World War II happened, which was the biggest kind of death death ever. But what's different about war now is he says that we claim that death of, uh, killing others now is protecting life here. It's as if those people existing over there, quote, the Middle East, the fact that any Muslims are anywhere over there is a threat to the health of anyone everywhere. Do you see what I'm saying? I actually don't think that. Do not sound by me. But it's not an invasion. We're not being invaded. It's merely their presence signifies war. That's a different kind of relationship. So it's war for the sake of protecting life, which is different than early modern war. So I think I'm out of time here, yeah? Can I get, can I get like two minutes? Okay, all right, so, <laughs> where is this? I'm trying to get my thing. So he argues then that the, where does sexuality come into this? I love, this is my favorite part. I wish I would have slow, gotten to this part quicker. <laughs> Modern power operates, he argues, in the 19th century, he writes, hum, human beings entered history as how can I say this? The fact that we have animal bodies became historically significant. We used to be outside of history because our bodies were reflections of God. We were distinct from nature, right? After Darwin, we're no longer distinct from the natural world. We are animals. Does that make sense? And are, are you guys with me? So our actual biology, our lifeness, our flesh, 
becomes historical. It becomes a political history. This is the enter, he's like, humanity enters history through life, through just being alive, the study of life. And when that happens, it allows, it's not like power was like sitting around like, there's like five white guys and they're playing the cards in the sky, and they're like, oh, you know what, did you guys notice Darwin? This is like the right chance to jump in. Like, there's no prearranged thing happening, right? But what he argues is, as the human body becomes a politicized flesh, two things happen to it. It becomes, there is the disciplined body, like the one I was just describing, go to the gym, the soldier's body. Why do soldiers, why are they so strong now when they have drones? Picture a soldier in the American Revolution. Do you picture a massive G.I. Joe dude? He should have been, because they didn't have any drones. They barely even had guns, right? Now we have massive machinery, and you have to, your body has to be disciplined too, right? And then it's connected to the regulated population. Modern power regulates people. He was very interested, for, in, for example, in New York City's public housing when he was studying the, for writing for the history of sexuality. The spatial organization of poor bodies, and particularly non-white bodies, in a way that made them visually available to the state, right? If these are the two uh, um, goals of the modern state, is to discipline the individual body, quote unquote, the desired body, to make it reproduce, and to regulate the other social body, and to make sure it's staying in its place and maybe not reproducing too much. What does that sound like? Eugenics. It's Nazism. I mean, that was kind of a little bit of a step. But do you hear what I'm saying? It's like, make sure these people are healthy and happy in a suburban home, having three children. Keep these people under surveillance. Regulate them. Watch them. These are, two, these, are, these are two forms of the modern society. And sexuality is the perfect domain to link them. Does that make sense? Because the, he argues like the woman's body becomes so, the woman's body becomes particularly um, policed because it is her body that, quote, produces the population. If she, like, you know, race mixing, for example, or you know, having a, a baby that's not somehow typically fit, right? So like the sterilization of people that we would call mentally ill. The woman's body becomes a way to create the disciplined body. Are you guys with me? So sexuality is the locus point at which all other of the most cruel forms of, of modern power are manifesting. It's a weird thing to consider, isn't it? By the way, he's not saying don't have sex. The guy had sex all the time. What he's asking you to do is question this idea that somehow self-knowledge and like a thorough investigation of your desires and your behaviors and your intentions and your healthfulness, right, is to set you free. Because the government doesn't give a shit about you. It wants to control us. There is a Marxist argument underlying this. It's a very basic one. He's not really saying there should be more workers. But at some point, before there were drones, the government, there was a lot more poor people. Right? Pop, after like, the, like the, the plague had passed, et cetera, agricultural practices increased, there were more and more poor people. The king didn't stand a chance. The king has to start to appear to care about you. Otherwise, he's toast, right? And now we think, that, and, it's, it's, and this is how modern powers operate. So this is where he comes up with the idea of biopolitics. So why does this matter? I'll re wrap this up here. Um, he says, those that are fighting for liberation, coming back to human rights, where I started, he said, what's the biggest bummer is when you, ask, when you look at the human rights language, it has been so reduced to, I want the right to live. Instead of, I want the right to read poetry and ascend to the highest form of being possible, right? It's like the logic of the oppressor becomes the only language of resistance, he argues. And what a trap that is for us, right? We get trapped in, our, in the language of the oppressor. And sexuality is linked with racism. We've internalized the king, which is a super bummer. 
That's it. 